Good evening and welcome to our day two of a two day program. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege again to welcome you all and thank you all for attending our 10th anniversary celebrations. I'm your host and my name is Vaish Shaker. I'm associated with the Center for Digital Enterprise, a center that intends to develop management concepts and perspectives through the lens of digital. In that sense, we are dedicated towards developing managerial and leadership talents for the digital world. And therefore, on behalf of IMU, it's my deep honor and privilege to welcome you all to this pioneering online event titled The Future. This is our day two of our two day event of thought provoking talks by eminent professors and international authors. Yesterday we heard uh, Professor Sunil Gupta from Harvard Business School and today it is Professor Jerry Kane who will be uh, speaking to us from Boston College. Along with that, we have a panel of uh, people from the industry from across the globe uh, who would be speaking to us. Interestingly, it is digital technology itself that is enabling us to connect live. Today, we'll be joined by Professor Gerald Kane from Boston College's Carroll School of Management followed by a panel discussion with industry professionals from India and UK. We start today's proceedings with an address by Professor Janat Shah, the founding director of IIM Udaipur. I take a moment to introduce Professor Janat Shah. Professor Shah has long teaching experience in leading management schools where he has shaped minds and molded careers of several business leaders of today. His commitment to teaching and enduring personality have one deep admirers and long lasting friends from academia and industry. He teaches operations management and supply chain where he commands authority and is the author of the book, Supply Chain Management, Text and Cases, which is extensively used in MBA and executive MBA courses. He has also published extensively in national and international journals on the subject. Professor Shah was a visiting scholar at Sloan School of Management, MIT, a visiting faculty with the Linguistic Institute of, sorry, the Logistics Institute of National University, Singapore, president of Society of Operations Management, India, and currently holds a position of special professor at Nottingham University. I now invite Professor Shah to address the audience. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the IMU community, I extend a warm welcome to day two of the Deep Future event. It's been a great pleasure to organize an event primarily focused on the future of the digital business world, making the celebration of 10 years of her establishment. My sincere gratitude goes out to Dr. Gerald Kane, Professor of Information Systems at Boston's College, Carroll School of Management, for accepting our invitation to deliver the keynote address on day two of the event. His book on the transformation myth, leading your organization through uncertain times, sheds light on the continuous process required to adapt to a disruptive environment. It also provides a framework for understanding disruption and tools for navigating it. We'll be hearing him live from Boston and we are grateful to him for accommodating this request. I would also like to thank Dr. Simon Roberts, Kanika Sanghi and Sanjay Menon for being part of the panel discussion on the rise of digital anthropology, which follows Dr. Kane's address. I'm thankful to all the panelists for their exceptional efforts. I'm also grateful to Professor Rajesh Nanarpuja for moderating the event. Professor Rajesh is a faculty in marketing with IIM Udaipur and is leading our interesting and novel initiative at Consumer Culture Lab. This event is a significant occasion for us. It'll also embark on the decade anniversary of IIM Udaipur which has been growing to be globally accredited 
and ranked Management B School since its inception in 2011. It's a matter of great pride when a second generation of I am like us completes a decade. For us though, it's just one landmark in our vision to build I am Udaipur as a global management institution of repute. I'm happy to note that I am Udaipur has added several achievements in this process during this 10 years. We are the youngest I am to have world recognized ASSB accreditation. It puts us alongside just 5% of the world's business schools recognized by this accreditation. We became only the fourth I am and the youngest institute in the world to be part of prestigious FT Global MIM top 100 rankings. We are only the third I am along with I am Ahmedabad and Bangalore to be in this ranking for third consecutive year. Similar is a story for a QS ranking. Our focus on high quality research has also led us to be ranked fourth in India by UT Dallas methodology for several years. We took the initiative of establishing centers of excellence in digital enterprise management and global supply chain management and now extended the effort to healthcare and fintech. Last year, we became the first B school to have a consumer culture lab. This lab is already taking many initiatives, including first time survey of understanding digital landscape of rural India. The consumer culture lab reflect I am Udaipur's effort to develop an ecosystem where innovative research and diversity of thought can thrive. A unique initiative in a B schools across the country, this lab bridges the knowledge gap and initiative. It initiates a con conversation on consumer culture and qualitative research in India. Recently, the lab worked on a research in digital space where they looked at correlation between choices of the rural populace Interpenetration, internet penetration in the villages and the challenges faced by those at the bottom of the pyramid. The strong foundation and achievements that we have built in the last 10 years have put us alongside IAMs and B schools established much earlier and ahead of many others. However, this remain just reassuring milestones that demonstrates how we are doing in the road of becoming the one of the leading management institutions in the world by 2030. Our vision 2030 continues to focus on high quality research and student transformation journey for our students. I'm pleased to share that now we have a vision owned by outstanding board, faculty, alumni, and staff. Let me illustrate the ambition ambitious nature of our vision by sharing with you our 2030 goals on the research front. For instance, even though we are consistently in the top four in research in India, our vision is to be in UT Dallas top 100 list for the world, where there's not a single B school in India in that list today. We have a similar ambitions on the education front also. As an institute, we're also among the foremost to recognize the growing importance of digital technologies and shaping business and economies. At IMU, digital technology and customer centricity are core areas. IMU also wants to take the lead in the way management research and management education would be shaped by digital technologies. We want to equip our students with management concepts and leadership styles required in emerging digital business enterprises. It's an imperative to rethink the fundamentals of leadership and strategy to leverage digital transformation. This rethinking motivated us to launch India's first ever one-year MBA in digital enterprise management for experienced professionals. Subsequently, we have also introduced digital-related courses in all our education programs. 
today's online event the future is another step in our effort to stimulate thought leadership in this digital focus future in the lessons and opportunities for businesses yesterday we had a very interesting session we had a keynote speech by dr sunil gupta from business howard business school followed by a panel discussion including the panelist bidisha nagaraj kavita chaturvedi and simon thomas same was moderated by my colleague professor shnyas pingali the ideas reinforced our belief that business schools would play very important role in successful implementation of digital technologies interestingly discussion focused on importance of a culture people processes and partner ecosystem most important question being what's the problem you're trying to solve i'm sure today's event will similarly help us understand role business schools can play in getting best out of digital revolution i hope this event will trigger some thought provoking conversations on the forever disrupting digital business world the vision with which the two evening event has been conceptualized and put together i want to acknowledge the efforts put in by amadepo team to make the event possible even more importantly i would like to recognize the immense contribution of all faculty staff alumni students service providers the immense who all have contributed to this great institution from the days of the foundation it would not have been possible without the vision and support of the governing board the industry and recruiter as we complete 10 years without you it would not have been possible i once again welcome you all i wish all of us a most enriching and impactful webinar thank you thank you professor shah for your vision and leadership that i am udaipur has received over the years i'm sure uh, these distinctions that we have achieved has also set the culture for some great research and educational endeavors to happen here ladies and gentlemen it's my honor and privilege to introduce our keynote speaker for the day that's professor dr gerald k professor Kane has already logged in, and uh, I would uh, read a little about uh, Professor Kane here. Professor Kane is a professor of information systems and faculty director of Edmund H. Shear Jr. Center for Entrepreneurship at Boston College's Carroll School of Management. He researches and teaches how companies can understand and respond to digital disruption to undergraduate, graduate. and executive education students worldwide he has published over 100 papers articles reports on these topics he has written two books for mit press the technology fallacy how people are the real key to digital transformation and transformation myth leading your organization through uncertain times which was released in september 2021 professor kane's research interests involve how organizations develop strategy culture and talent in response to changes in the competitive landscape wrought by digital technology such as social media mobile devices internet of things analytics and emerging technologies like virtual reality augmented reality and artificial intelligence his published research has appeared in mis quarterly information systems research organization science management science marketing science harvard business review and mit sloan management some of his papers are coming of age digitally learning leadership and legacy which was printed in 2018 achieving digital maturity in 2017 aligning the organization for its digital future 2016 strategy not technology drives digital transformation in 2015 professor kane has also consulted with fortune 500 companies 
and taught executive education worldwide on managing and competing within an increasingly digital environment. As you can know, Professor Kane is passionate and deeply involved in the space of digital. And then I request Professor Kane to speak to us about his latest book, The Transformation Myth, Leading Your Organization Through Uncertain Times. Welcome, Professor Kane. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, can every, let me share my screen. Can everybody see my presentation? Are we good on the, can you see the screen? Uh, not yet, Professor Kane. Okay, then it's let me. Screen. Uh, I will stop that. Screen. Let me. We've only been using Zoom for 18 months. You think we would have it down to a science at this point. Let's try this one. Now, can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you. wonderful. Um, so thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's a real honor to be uh, present uh, at this, you know, monumentous event for your university. Um, you know, there are many downsides to the pandemic, uh, but there are also a few upsides, one of which being the opportunity to speak globally in ways that we never would have thought of before. You know, uh, tw two years ago, I'm sure we would have thought about flying people around the world uh, to make this happen, as opposed to, you know, these super new um, digital platforms that really sort of enable a digital presence much more easily uh, than ever before. Uh, and that's really the topic of what we're talking about here. So I'm actually going to present uh, results from both of my books because they actually fit together pretty well. Um, the technology fallacy and the transformation myth. Um, where this started um, is that I led a research initiative for five years through MIT Sloan Management Review and Deloitte. Uh, and as a part of that uh, research, uh, we were investigating how uh, legacy companies are really adapting to a digital world or to digital change. Over the course of this five years, uh, every year we did a survey. Um, and over the course of those five years, we got 20,000 responses to our survey. About a third of these are were inside of the United States and a third were outside of the United States. And they spanned 157 different countries, 28 industries of a multiple um, different sizes of organizations. Then we took uh, the results of that study and then went to talk to, uh, over the course of five years, well over 100 uh, executives who are leading digital change in their organization uh, to get an idea of sort of how to explain or how to understand the results of our study. Um, the key construct uh, that we study is a concept we call digital maturity. Um, and if you look very, at the very small print here at the bottom of your screen, uh, every year we ask respondents to imagine an ideal organization utilizing digital technologies and capabilities to improve processes, engage talent across the organization, and drive new and value-generated business models. How close is your organization to that ideal on a scale of one to 10? Um, if companies uh, responded that we were far away from that ideal, um, rated themselves a one, two, a three, we called those early stage companies. And about 25% of our sample uh, fell into that group. Um, if a company, a respondent rated their company uh, between a four to a six, we called those developing, and that was 45% um, of the results uh, of sort of 44% of our respondents. Um, and then last but not least, if they rated themselves a seven or above, we called that the maturing category. Um, and what was really sort of it, uh, heartening over the course of the five years of research is we saw a very marked shift to the right um, uh, you know, over the years. Over the course of um, the five years, we saw 10 percentage points fewer put themselves in the early stage company and between three to 5% put them uh, in the developing or maturing categories. Now, so that's the five years of research that really concluded um, in September of 2020, uh, oh, September of 2019. Uh, and we wrote a book on this because we really realized that the, we wrote individual reports out of it, but we really realized that the whole, we, were, we weren't telling the whole story. And so that was the birth of the first book. And we were already planning a follow-up 
uh, the tech to the technology fallacy. Um, and we actually had our pitch meeting with MIT Press in March of 2020. And it became two things became apparent um, in that moment. First was that the world was beginning to undergo a very significant change. Um, that you know, it was in those early days, lockdowns were starting. We realized that the coronavirus uh, was going to sort of disrupt uh, life, at least for the short term as we knew it. Um, so we were in the midst of that. And at the same time, we also realized uh, that the findings of our first book remained remarkably applicable to what companies were dealing with. And we, want, we, we wanted to investigate why. Why was it this research on digital disruption proving particularly salient as companies were dealing with COVID? Um, and our working hypothesis in the book is that we're really just talking about different types of disruption. Digital change and digital disruption is something we call chronic disruption. So we, we borrow from the medical literature to distinguish between chronic and acute conditions. And we call digital disruption a chronic uh, disruption. Uh, it's slow building and persistent. It's not always obvious. It can be overlooked. Um, it requires sustained treatment um, that must be tolerable over time and it's long lasting and cannot simply be cured. In contrast, an acute disruption um, is what we experienced in COVID. It was sudden, rapid, and severe. It's obvious and attention getting. Uh, it requires a dramatic response and it can be temporary, although it can develop into uh, chronic conditions. Um, and what we found was that many of the applications for um, chronic disruption really applied to what companies were dealing with with acute disruption. And you see Janet McLaurin of uh, Gensler said the whole pandemic had really just been an accelerant for things that were already happening. I'm going to skip that one. Um, and as we interviewed people on how their company was responding to COVID in those early days, we interviewed people from really from March of 2020 through the end, through, through December of 2020 or January of 21, um, surprisingly positive in terms of business standpoint. Some of our respondents said, these have been some of the best weeks of my career. It's actually been much more of a positive. Um, the disruption didn't change anything. We had a vision and we accelerated the implementation. Uh, some of the more optimistic are those at the bottom. This situation is, this is the head of Google Cloud saying this. Um, this situation is what my team and I have been preparing for our entire lives. Uh, and Andy Rubin, the CEO of a, a startup called Trove, uh, said we adopted the mindset that this is our moment and we can't miss our moment. So uh, executives that have been lobbying for digital change in that chronic environment really found that the pandemic was an excuse to sort of accelerate changes they had in place. And now the data um, is really bearing out that, you know, what we experienced was about 10 years of digital change over the course of 2020, 2021. Um, and so if you look at e-commerce uh, adoption, at least in the U.S., that went up uh, by about 10 years worth of, of growth in that short period of time. Other numbers bear it out as well. Um, and so uh, the two books uh, taken together, uh, we're going to roughly follow the, the structure of, of the book one, number one, Navigating Disruption, What Are We Talking About, Becoming a Digital Organization, and then Rethinking Le Leadership and Talent uh, for a Digital Age. And I didn't update these slides. These are actually, it was actually out as of September 21 uh, is the transformation myth. And taking together, um, I really talk about this as these two books under uncover the two lies of digital transformation. Um, the technology fallacy uncovers the, the lie that it always involves implementing digital tools. And in fact, what we found in our first research um, that most of, many of the more pressing challenges um, with digital disruption has less to do with implementing technology and more to do with the organizational, the leadership, uh, the talent, the strategy changes that are needed to really leverage um, those technologies uh, for business advantage. 
The second lie we uncover in the transformation myth is that it involves a single transformation. Because even as we were investigating COVID, we realized that there are a number of different disruptions really piled on top of each other, whether it's, uh, at least in the US, uh, movements towards racial injustice, you know, sort of sort of combating that, whether it's continued disruption of, of um, climate change, whether it's continued disruption of digital, uh, you know, all of these things factored in together. And most of our respondents says it's not just one, it wasn't just COVID. It was all of the disruptions around 2021 that really created this environment. Uh, and then, but the, the takeaway is, if you think disruption is going to be over uh, when we ever emerge from uh, this COVID crisis, uh, I think you're fooling yourselves. Uh, so I think disruption, is, the thesis of the book is the dis disruption is the new normal. And we actually think that the more disruptive aspect on business is going to be in the coming three to five years as we begin to have the opportunity to return to a sense of normalcy. Um, what changes are going to be permanent and what changes um, are going to go away? And I think companies that want to go all the way back to February of 2020 to pre-pandemic ways of working are going to find that many of their competitors had developed new capabilities, have developed new competencies, and they're going to be more competitive and more um, agile and flexible than ever before. And if you don't sort of lock in those changes and learn how to compete in new ways, you will be left behind. So we hear a lot about the great resignation or the movement of talent. Um, that's, you know, people are going to want to move and have more flexibility to move to organizations that are competitive than ever before. Um, and so we're, we're just going to see a shift uh, and a strengthening of those um, who really sort of embrace the moment to drive innovative digital change uh, and create new and more competitive organizations as a result. So what are we dealing with? So let's go back um, to pre-pandemic uh, ways of working. We asked a, a text, an open text question where we just, in our 3,000 respondents or 3,500 respondents, we asked just a question, what is the main difference between working in a digital business, digital environment versus a traditional one? And we just had them you know, type in and fill in um, the gaps of, of what they thought their answer was. Um, and the number one response was the pace of business was different. So it's not as much that things happen differently, but it was happening much faster. Um, and uh, sort of the lesson we've learned is that sometimes it's now gotten to the point where it's moved so quick, it is moving so quickly and changing so quickly that old and former ways of doing business just don't work anymore. Uh, culture and mindset. Uh, number two, flexible distributed workplace, increased productivity, improved use uh, and access to tools, greater connectivity. And I would actually argue that all of these things that were different about digital business before the pandemic are even more so true now, that the pace of business has changed, culture and mindset is changing, flexible distributed workplace obviously has just been blown up. Um, and so all, of, and productivity, so many companies say, uh, actually, when we've switched to remote working, our productivity went up um, and other things were affected. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but so these things have just doubled down what we already found pre-pandemic. Um, also, before the pandemic, um, we asked, what was the biggest difference? Um, uh, you know, how big, how likely is digital to disrupt your industry? 87% and we call this the, the knowing doing gap. 87% of respondents said digital technologies will disrupt my industry, but only 44% said their organizations were doing enough. Um, and why this was the case, um, we, we asked a, a follow-up question, you know, what's the biggest threat facing your company as a result of digital trends? The most common answer was internal issues, uh, that we are our own worst enemy. We can't change and adapt fast enough to compete in a digital world. The other responses were market environment and competitive pressure that our, our competitors are getting much stronger, much more aggressive um, as a result of digital, and that's changing the environment. Now, what was really interesting is that um, we asked a follow-up, we asked two questions. One, is your organization going to be in a stronger or weaker position going forward as a result of digital trends, and then why? 
And what was really interesting is those that said we were going to be in a weaker position were far more likely to say it's a result of the competitive pressure. Those which say that they're going to be in a stronger position say we are going to develop the digital capabilities we need to compete and we can do that. And one of the biggest sort of aha moments for me uh, in the research um, was when I connected it to the work of Carol, Stanford psychologist Carol Dweck, who talks about the difference between fixed and growth mindset. Fixed mindset people, and, and she defined it at the individual level, um, where fixed mindset people believe that success or failure is sort of an inherent result of your inherent skills or capabilities, and therefore are attributable to those abilities. Therefore, success or failure really has mostly to do with the environment. Whereas growth mindset people believe that success or failure is largely attributable to hard work and you, your success is going to be whether you do the work necessary to thrive and compete. Um, and I hear fixed mindset all the time in companies that we're not a digital company, we're a legacy company, I'm not a digital person. Those are all fixed mindset um, statements. Whereas growth mindset is we can develop, we can cultivate the capabilities at both the individual and the organizational level to really become a digital, digitally mature organization. And in many ways, it's that mindset shift that is the most important thing um, to accomplish in terms of digital transformation. Just you know, getting the culture and the belief among employees that it can be done. Um, so if we look at growth mindset in terms of COVID, we uh, argue that it really takes place in a three-stage process, respond, recover, and thrive. What respond is, um, is that is what happened in March and April, maybe May of 2020. It's, we all have to lock down. We all have to figure out how to do work remotely. You know, for me, it's, I don't know what happened for, for in, in, in India, but, you know, we sent our college students home and we had to figure out how to do the rest of the semester uh, using Zoom. Uh, it was ugly, uh, but we got it done. And many companies had the same experiences. We just have to start figuring out how to work remotely. And that's what happened in March, April, May, how do we work so we keep the lights on? How do we sort of respond to the crisis at a hand? Then it's recover. And I would argue recover is June 2020, really through the present, um, where we're figuring out these new capabilities, we're putting in place um, uh, sort of with new ways of working, uh, we're figuring out how the environment has changed, um, and we're, we're sort of studying these changes and learning how to adapt to them and learning really where the opportunities are. The thrive phase we think has still yet to come. We think this is the next three to five years as the world opens back up and hopefully it's coming soon and this Omicron thing doesn't you know, derail us considerably. Uh, but in some ways it doesn't matter because it's when the world can begin to open up is are, that's when the companies that have really sort of engaged in digital innovation can move forward at much faster of a, of a, of a pace. And I think we're going to see a real split between the companies and the leaders that just want to go back to the way things were and those who say, this is our opportunity. We don't want to miss our opportunity. We're going to sort of drive change. Um, and I really think organizations in this latter group are those that are going to emerge from the pandemic much stronger uh, than ever before. Um, and so as we looked and studied how companies were using technology to deal with uh, digital disruption, um, we identified four what we call superpowers. You know, the academic term, which I used in the first book that I really liked, was affordances. Uh, but that never caught on for some reason. Um, and so we changed it to superpowers, which really means the same thing. It's not having the technology, it's what you do with the technology that's really important. Uh, and these four are nimbleness, scalability, stability, and optionality. And let's go through those real quickly. Uh, nimbleness is the speed at which organizations act and the ability to pivot when circumstances merit a significant change in direction. We used to do this, now we do that. Um, one great example is Marriott, the, the hotel chain, experienced a 90% drop in demand. And so like, what do you do as a leader? You, you, I mean, there's only so much you, only so much you can respond. Um, what Marriott did, uh, did was pivoted their entire call center 
um, and began to work for the state of New York processing the 100x increase in processing in uh, unemployment claims. Uh, and so they took these skilled uh, call center workers and just retrained and pivoted them to an entirely different capability. Um, the other great example is uh, Hitachi Ventara, the manufacturing company. They had already uh, implemented their sensors uh, in, in their smart, you know, in their sensor is in their factory. And over the course of two weeks, they did a hackathon and were really able to repurpose that sensor network to become a social distance monitoring uh, system. So it could monitor for use the, the IR capabilities of many of their sensors to monitor whether their employees had fevers. They used spatial you know, tracking to see whether they were maintaining socially distant and they provided feedback scores for all their employees on how well they were doing um, at these, these social distancing things. So uh, once you had that digital infrastructure in place, it was possible to be nimble and pivot that entire infrastructure to ad address the new problem. Um, and so we specifically use the term nimbleness here instead of agility, um, because agile has very particular uh, meaning in terms of software development. And, and you certainly can be nimble through agile methods, but these two examples of, of Marriott pivoting and Hitachi Ventara pivoting aren't you know, small experiments. They are massive changes of the organization that are possible when the digital platforms can just be repurposed. Um, once they're in place, they can be repurposed in that way. Second, we go to stability. And this is the ability to handle an unprecedented increase or decrease of demand really overnight. And you see examples, uh, positive examples, whether it's uh, online platforms like Instacart or Amazon, or you know, we, some companies saw a massive spike in demand um, and they had to adapt to that. That was a disruption in and of itself. Uh, and then we also saw the ability to sort of ramp down um, capabilities. So the airlines and, and Hilton, you know, uh, are, are two really good ones where demand dropped. So we had to readapt the, the, the company to respond. Hilton was a great story where they had a hiring system you know, to bring employees into the organization that they simply reversed. Um, and they worked out partnerships with Amazon and UPS and other, you know, employers that were experiencing upticks in demand. And they allowed their Hilton employees that were going to need, they were likely going to have to lay off anyway, but moved them into the right organization, uh, into these other organizations. And Amazon loved it because... Uh, they, they got the Hilton seal of approval on these employees. They, they knew they were good workers and they didn't have to worry as much about them. Um, and then Hilton loved it because they did right by their employees. And it was really interesting. And they, they felt like if we do right by our employees, when the crisis is over and demand starts to come back, our employees will, will value that and will come back to work for us. Um, and in fact, that's largely what we saw. Hilton was voted uh, the number three best place to work in the U.S., despite having laid off 50,000 people that year. And they said they were that because they treated them with such humanity. The third one is stability. So this is really um, the ability for companies to maintain operational excellence. Um, and this is really the cloud companies that I think have, have thrived here, whether it's Google Cloud or AWS or Zoom. Um, these platforms, you know, I was ready for Zoom to collapse, you know, as the increasing demand was placed on it. Um, and they did a remarkable job. And I actually asked the head of Google, Google Cloud, were you ever worried it was gonna uh, crash? And he said, no, Google actually maintains enough computing power on site to power the internet, something like nine times over. Um, this is largely to protect from denial of service attacks, but it worked really well when the demand creeps up like that. So these cloud computing, I think, really sort of in created stability for companies. And then last but not least is optionality. And this is the ability to add on new features or capabilities very easily. A great example here um, is a restaurant firm, Portillo's, a restaurant chain. Um, obviously, in-person dining disappeared, um, and so they were able to sort of use their digital platform to pivot. Um, they, their, their digital platform, Olo, was able to use uh, their capabilities to convert and add capabilities of the call center uh, and add delivery. So they were able to sort of start their own delivery service in the matter of a couple of weeks um, 
as a result of the platforms they were they had in place um, and and adapt better there. So let's look at um, but how do we become a digital organization? And what we found uh, one of the real interesting things we found early on in our first research is that culture was a major driver um, of digital uh, maturity. So we, we found that digitally mature companies had a very distinct culture um, compared to less mature companies. And they were sort of things like they actively increased agility, they encouraged experiments and continual learning, they recognized and rewarded collaboration, they accept risk of failure, and they're increasingly organized around cross-functional teams. Um, furthermore, this culture was intentional. Uh, 80% of digitally maturing companies said they were actively implementing initiatives to try to drive these cultural characteristics compared to early stage companies, only 23%. And digitally maturing companies were likely to report investing more in these efforts in the months to come. And then last but not least, digitally maturing companies were much more likely to use this uh, digital culture to drive further change in the organization. So we asked uh, respondents, how does your organization uh, drive digital? Early stage companies said they mandate it from the management. The boss says do it and everybody's supposed to fall in line. Uh, developing companies, uh, they just expected employees to be motivated to embrace them. If they put in the tools, they expected employees to do the work um, to sort of new, learn how to leverage these tools. But those maturing companies said, we drive digital business adoption by cultivating a strong digital business culture that strives for risk-taking, collaboration, agility, and continuous learning. So this, these three things take together begs the question, or at least beg the question before the pandemic, will the rich get richer? If culture drives digital transformation and digitally maturing companies are investing more, we might see a widening gap between the digitally mature companies uh, and those that are falling behind. And we expected pre-pandemic to see this gap uh, continuing to grow. The outstanding question now, though, is can COVID be that trigger to help the companies that were behind build momentum? We saw early on that there's this knowing doing gap, that everybody knows digital disruption is happening, but there wasn't the will to do something about it. Well, COVID might, if there's a silver lining from a business perspective with respect to COVID, is has it jump-started the innovation and the digital capabilities of enough companies that they will compete more strongly going forward. And I think that's the real question that we have, we're facing in the next three to five months. Are those companies that were behind, I would argue were 10 years behind and have now caught up, are they going to use that to sort of go more boldly into the future and continue innovating, or are they going to want to go back? And I think that's going to be the differentiator. And that's sort of the purpose of this new book is to say, don't go back. Now is the time to innovate. Somewhat interesting, um, culture, you know, the importance of culture um, can guide decisions about like, well, how do we think about the remote workplace? Um, we talked about how one of the pros of remote work was that productivity didn't really drop. Um, so many people found that they were far more productive in the remote settings uh, than they were before. Yet there are a lot of cons to remote work. Culture is hard to cultivate. Innovation is hard to cultivate. Casual relationships and weak ties that are so important for knowledge sharing uh, don't happen. We have data you know, from around the world showing that you know, we strengthen the relationships with people we interact with regularly. We decreased it with those that we casually interact with. Building trust and rapport, mentoring and coaching, all of these things are cons to remote work. And so as we go back, you know, what is the, the workplace of the future going to look like? And there's a lot of challenges with respect to this. Um, there's disagreement on going back to the office. A lot of younger employees absolutely want to go back to the office, at least in the U.S. of the people I've talked to. Um, whereas older employees, I'm perfectly fine staying in my, my nice uh, home office uh, where I'm comfortable and I have a nice, I can see my kids come home from school and I can pet my dog when I have a break. And, you know, I, it's been really easy for me to work from home, but other people don't have that flexibility. Um, many people have moved during the pandemic to be nearer to support. And then what happens when um, 
organizations say, okay, now you need to come back to the office, but people have moved away. Um, and then lastly, but last but not least, many companies have found the remote work is a great chance to hire a more diverse workforce um, and to tap into talent that aren't in there, particularly in Silicon Valley, tap into talent that aren't right there. Um, and so what do you do when you when you can go back to the office, but now your workforce is scattered throughout the world? Um, it just creates some challenges. And I think most companies um, really need to, now is the time to be thinking very intentionally about what we want the workplace to look like, because I do think decisions made now about how you want the workplace to look is going to have a massive impact on the type of employees you're going to be able to uh, attract for the future. Um, and so I think these decisions of what is the post-pandemic workplace going to look like um, can be sort of like deal breakers for many companies and many just aren't, many executives just aren't putting the, the work and the thought into it. A couple of other interesting things. Um, one thing that was surprising, and this is true of both uh, digital disruption and COVID was that um, cross-functional teams turned out to be very important. Um, we saw that, we saw a surprising connection between cross-functional teams and digital maturity. Um, and we heard that come up uh, during COVID interviews with these cross-functional teams were really essential for managing. Um, and sort of my conclusion is that these cross-functional teams are really important when uncertainty is high, because when you're in a turbulent environment and things are changing, whether it's changing slowly as a result of digital or quickly as a result of COVID, you don't know who needs to know what, and only by having representatives from multiple different stakeholders in the room can you make sure that everybody knows what they need to know and that you get all the information uh, together that you need. Um, and so cross-functional teams, and then what we found was that digitally mature companies uh, manage these cross-functional teams differently. They're more likely to have autonomy. Um, they were more likely to be, to be evaluated as a team rather than individuals in that team. And the leadership creates the environment uh, that it can thrive, uh, that it can, can really succeed. So it's not just about having cross-functional teams, it's about managing those cross-functional teams in a very specific way. Um, and we asked interviewees, uh, why is this the case? Because this really surprised me. Uh, the CIO of Harley Davidson, that's just how digital is. It crosses functions, so you have to according, uh, organize accordingly. Uh, the chief digital officer, Freddie Mac, said you have to organize differently to think differently. Um, John Hancock said it allows us to get digital groups working free from organizational bureaucracy. Um, and uh, so protecting them. Shahmi Mohammed of Carmax said that teams enable greater opportunity for experimentation. What was interesting about that interview is we talked to him uh, first in 2016, uh, and he said, I don't know what the world is going to be like uh, in three to five years. All I know is it's going to be characterized by rapid change. And we talked to him during the pandemic. And he said that has absolutely been indispensable for surviving because I didn't know a pandemic was coming. But because we were prepared to respond to disruption, we have been able to sort of th manage this uh, and thrive in this. And there's a great book uh, by Stanley McChrystal of the U.S. Army Team of Teams that really talks. That he had to completely reorganize his U.S. Army um, to compete, to, to, vary, to deal with digital threats because the old structure just wasn't agile and nimble enough. So let's go to rethinking leadership and talent in a digital age. And I'll go about 10 more minutes and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, uh, one of the real surprising things to me, so I, I came in with a working hypothesis that uh, digitally maturing companies were just gonna have better leaders. Um, and in fact, that's really not what we found. Um, if you look at the gold line here, we ask the question, does org your organization need to find new leaders to compete in a digital, to, to succeed in a digital age? Um, you know, about 70 to 80 percent of early stage companies said we needed uh, better leaders. But about 50 to 60 percent of maturing companies said we also need those better leaders. Um, so what's going on there? The differentiator was this other question is, is my organization effectively developing leaders who have the capabilities necessary to lead in a digital environment? And that's where we saw a massive differentiation. So whereas 10% of 
early stage companies said that they were using it to drive change or they were preparing the leaders they needed 80 to 90% of those in maturing companies said they were doing it. So nobody has enough leaders. The maturing companies are just doing something about it. What do those skills look like? Um, surprisingly, they, they're not really predominantly about tech skills. It's about having a transformative vision. It's about being forward looking. It's about being change oriented. And these are all open text questions that you know, these we just ask people, what skills do digital leaders need? And this is what they told us. Last but not least, or number four, I should say, is an understanding of the technology. Now, two things that are important here. The understanding of the technology is more of a general digital literacy. Um, it's not necessarily about being a, a deep learning expert or big, you know, using Hadoop to analyze you know, big data. Uh, it's really much more about um, understanding what the general technology trends are. Conversely, I would argue it's really hard to be forward looking and have a transformative vision if you don't also have that understanding of where the technology is. So having technological literacy is important, but they don't need to necessarily be technical people. Um, I often tell my audiences that it's much easier for me to teach the executive leaders the digital knowledge they need to be effective leaders than it is to, to teach the technical leaders all of the business skills they need to, to succeed. Um, and much of this is not rocket science. Um, it's, do you have commitments, time, energy, and resources uh, to making things successful? Do you have a vision for your future? Do you provide your employees the opportunity to develop? These are all associated with two to three times uh, greater success factors. Um, last, you know, as far as leadership, we found that, that leadership was really critical through COVID. Uh, I heard the term North Star uh, so many times that, you know, as the daily work is disrupted, they looked to the leaders uh, to say, where, you know, what do we need to do here? And the organization's purpose and its values and its mission were really critical to helping companies, helping employees know how to navigate disruption. And I'm going to actually argue um, that what we're seeing right now is a golden age of corporate leadership. Because as I interviewed, and we interviewed like 40 to 50 executives for the, the new book. And I walked away from almost all of them uh, just inspired by how they were leading their organizations. Um, one was Hilton, and we already talked about that. And this, we interviewed the chief HR officer who, who really sort of very presciently said, we're going to make sure we do right by our employees. We're going to create the, they could have just laid people off, but he said, we need to make sure we do this right, or it's going to affect us in the future. And that was just very inspiring. Second is Kristen Darby, who's the chief information officer of Envision Health. Um, and she was... Envision Health is the largest physician group that manages uh, doctors in emergency rooms in New York and New Jersey. So in terms of the U.S., she was ground zero um, for uh, the, U the U.S. healthcare response. Uh, and just so many interesting stories, like she told a story about how her group hacked together um, a, a, a tablet app, so your, your iPads, so that doctors and nurses, in the absence of PPE, which was uh, pr protective equipment, which was so scarce early in the, um, uh, in the pandemic, they hacked it so they could use the cameras on both sides of the tablet, one to monitor the, uh, the patient, the other to monitor the equipment, so that they reduced the number of times that doctors and nurses needed to go into the room. So they called it electronic PPE. Um, Beam Suntory, the premium spirits uh, brand, really uh, went uh, completely pivoted um, to create hand sanitizer in the early days of the pandemic. Um, and I just thought, okay, you're an alcohol company, so of course you know how to do this. And I got to talk to the people who were responsible for this, um, and it was a non-trivial problem. They really sort of did some remarkable innovating to be able to make that happen uh, and produce something like 20,000 gallons of hand sanitizer that would have had a, a, you know, a, a, 
no, like 50,000 gallons of hand sanitizer that would have had a market value of $20 million at the time that they just donated because they thought, you know, giving back to their community had always been an important part of that, of their, their mission. Um, and employees said, you know, we know we're not doing rocket science here, but this was one thing we could do. And it was really motivating um, to make this happen. Um, last but not least, um, Humana, the, it's a health insurer in the U.S., um, and so their mission is to provide you for the best health of their members. Um, and then in early stages, they realized on some of the calls they were getting that food insecurity was a major problem for some of their members. Um, and so they completely reinterpreted their mission as needing to provide meals to those who need it and delivered, made and delivered over a million meals over the course of the first three months of the pandemic. This isn't what this company does. They're not a food services company, but they figured out how to make that happen because they felt like it was an important part of their mission uh, to provide for the best health because if they didn't have the food to the right place at the right time, um, it, you know, their employees or their customers couldn't be healthy. Um, I'm going to skip this one and we're going to move to talent with the last, you know, two minutes or so. I'll cover a couple of things here. So the old joke is, um, CFO says, what if we train people and they leave? And the CEO says, what if we don't and they stay? Um, from an early stage, we saw that wanting to work for a digital company, um, was really important to employees. Um, so, and it, irregardless of age or irrespective of age, um, you know, companies wanted to work for a digital leader. And, and on our team, we had a real fight. We said, are you going, are people going to leave uh, as a result? Um, and in fact, uh, what we found was similar to the leadership question, does your organization need a significantly new or different talent base to compete effectively in the digital economy? Um, we saw, again, a gap here, but, you know, 85, 75, 85% in early stage companies, less, doesn't even go below 50% for maturing companies. So everybody needs new talent. That's the purple line there. But is your organization's embrace of digital attracting new talent? We saw a huge gap here um, from, you know, 10% of early stage companies to 90% of digitally maturing companies. And this is, I think, the most pressing thing that companies are gonna deal with over the next one to three years is as employees have greater opportunity to go anywhere and work anywhere, they're going to be attracted to the companies that provide them opportunities to grow and thrive. So what we see here is I'll go through these real quickly and then we'll open it up for questions. How are you strengthening your digital innovation capabilities? Early stage companies, either hire contractors or my favorite answer is, I don't know is the second most popular answer there is I, I don't know what we're doing. Whereas developing and maturing companies are developing their employees for the future. I interviewed the chief digital officer of MetLife, the global health insurer or the global insurer. And he said, oh, I'm always on the lookout for good talent, but my job is to make sure the employees we have have the skills they need to, th to thrive in a digital world. And then if you look at the second most popular answer in maturing, recruiting digital employees is what in, uh, digital maturing companies do. And companies like Adobe, um, they don't wait for employees to apply for them. They go on LinkedIn and seek out the employees that have the skill sets they want and say, how do you, how would you like to come work for a digital leader? Um, that the chief human relations officer that led that effort is now the, the chief human relations officer of Walmart. Um, and so, you know, to recruiting the employees they need yet by and large companies aren't doing it. Um, respondents will do two more slides then I'll open it up. Um, respondents by and large said, I need to update my skills at least annually to succeed in a digital environment. 80 to 95% to of employees said that at the very least. Yet those that say I'm satisfied with how my company is developing me for a digital environment. Um, the most popular one, the, the best one is tech. And they were only at 50%. And it goes down to you know, 25 to 15% in auto manufacturing and consumer goods. 
Why is this important? So in our fight, uh, in our team, of our employees going to leave, um, they were more likely to leave within a year um, if their company was not providing them opportunities to develop in a digital environment. So what we found was that sometimes the gap was 15 times as much. So if you look at VP directors, 30% um, of, of said, I am likely to leave my company in a year um, if my, and that's across all maturity levels. But if they were providing opportunities to develop in a digital environment, that went down to 2%. So it's not that employees want to jump ship. It's they want <coughs> to make sure their skill set remains open uh, and viable in a new, uh, in the digital environment. And this, I think, is going to be sort of the most challenging thing going forward. And I think things as, as we, we pivot to sort of like a discussion of what can business schools do about this, I think continual learning is sort of the, the key factor in um, adapting to a digital world. And I think the more that organizations can create environments, not just through training programs, but through, you know, through in structuring work in a way that they can continue to learn new skills. And I think to the extent that business schools, I think it's great that we focus on, you know, educating the traditional 18 to 22 year olds, educating the masters and graduate level. I think the more that we can sort of retool ourselves to an environment of lifelong learning so that people can come back to us um, and sort of continue to develop their skill sets. I think digital disruption, particularly in COVID, um, is a real opportunity for higher education. I don't think that, um, and, and I think we're by and large getting it wrong. So I don't think it's about as much taking our classrooms and putting them out into the world it's now creating a platform by which education can happen, by we take the best of our alumni uh, and the best of our current students, and we can create new ways of, of interacting that the older established people can learn from the young, the young can have opportunities and connections uh, that they wouldn't get otherwise. And so I think it's a real opportunity to rethink the classroom itself. I'm not saying give up traditional education, but I think it's uh, it's an opportunity to bring outside resources into the, the conversation in the classroom to make the, the, the learning uh, even more relevant. So I will drop you, leave you with that sort of controversial topic uh, and then open it up to see if we have any questions uh, that we and further discussions that we want to engage in. Thank you so much for listening. I apologize for talking straight for 45 minutes, but uh, huh, we're done. Thank you, Dr. Kin, uh, and uh, I'll let you get, get a sip of water. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the fascinating talk and, uh, and sharing the findings. I think most companies in India are going through almost the same decision points that some of the companies that you mentioned. So I think there are many learnings from, uh, <clears throat> from the presentation today that can be imbibed uh, by our audience. And I think this is reflecting in the number of questions that <laughs> we have received. So we have close to uh, about 400 participants today, including students, alumni, faculty, and corporate executives. So, and, and lots of questions. So we're not able to go through all the questions, but uh, hopefully once the book is more easily available in India, uh, a lot of the listeners will get hold of the copies and that will answer uh, some of their questions. But I just thought we'll you know, kind of go through a handful of those questions, if that's okay with you. Uh, yeah. I'll start off with a very simple one. Why did you name it Technology Fallacy? Yeah, that's a good question. The, the the funny story about that was we had written, we, we did the title last. So we had written the entire book um, and then we said, okay, what are we gonna name it? And it took us, it, it was almost as hard to come up with the title as it was to write the rest of the, write the book. Uh, and fortunately, one of my co-authors is the former CMO of Deloitte. Um, and so he, I just said, you come up with the title. Um, and so we went through a bunch and technology fallacy um, came, you know, we, we liked that. Um, and, but we never de described what we meant by that in the book. And so now that I'm giving talks, it's, it's nice to be able to sort of say what we mean. Um, and I define the technology fallacy as this mistaken belief 
that just because an organization's challenges are caused by digital technology, that it also means that the solutions involve digital technology. Because what we found was that many of the more profound, you know, just in this talent thing, um, the talent problem can be solved digitally. If you look at Salesforce, they have a really great online learning platform uh, that helps their employees learn. But <coughs> another company we interviewed, Aetna, um, the health insurer, um, they developed, they had a traditional tuition reimbursement program that what they did was they decided um, that uh, they were going to reimburse, they, they did a strategic analysis of the talents they needed, 15 talent groups they needed to compete in the digital world, and they were going to reimburse their employees at three times the rate if they went and got a degree in one of these 15 areas. Uh, did that involve technology at all? No, you know, it didn't, it didn't do anything differently, but did it get them the skills they needed to be a better digital company? Absolutely. And they did an ROI analysis and found that this decision paid back like 100 to 150% of ROI just in terms of employee retention and promotion and skills that they would have otherwise had to hire out for on the market. So um, the technology fallacy is just because you're dealing with digital disruption means that the, you have to implement technology to make it happen. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yeah. Uh, that's a question I had myself as well. So I'm glad somebody asked that. Yeah, if um, we had done it better, we would have put it in the <laughs> intro of the book, but you know, such a life. <laughs> Yeah, though I did notice that in the transformation myth, you have explained why you called it <laughs> that we learn from our mistakes. <laughs> so great. Uh, so the, you talked a lot about how can organizations structure themselves to handle continuous disruption, right? And I think that's where the transformation myth that it's not a one-time activity; it's going to it's going to be continuous. So a lot of questions on that, but I guess the the broad theme is that you spoke about how cross-functional teams help in managing this. But I guess the question is what came first? I mean, is it that companies that were already structured cross-functional were able to adapt to digital faster or have you actually uh, met companies who have restructured themselves to adapt to digital? Um, I think we've seen both. Um, so, you know, a good example is John Hancock. Uh, they What they did was they hired the chief marketing officer of a digital uh, of Digitas, which is a, a sort of a digital uh, a consultancy, um, to to sort of lead their digital efforts, and they intentionally then set up these cross functional teams. You know, their logic was at least in terms of financial services. It's such a regulated industry. What would happen was innovation teams would come up with new innovations go to legal and compliance and legal and compliance would just say, well, no, that's not, that's not going to work. And so unless you had the legal people in that team, helping them come up with solutions that were also legally compliant, was that going to happen? And they said, we need to protect these teams. Um, but she also said, we can't just have innovation teams. We need to then start moving people through these teams to infect them with this innovation mindset. Um, so I don't think it's, so that was a, a time when uh, you know, they intentionally did cross-functional teams to sort of get the digital function going. Contrast that with CarMax said, I, I just need to be uh, more agile and teams let me do that because it, it lets me task team one with experiment A, task team two with experiment B, run it for uh, six weeks and then see what happens and then reevaluate. And so he wasn't doing that specifically to become more digital, but just to make his, his organization more agile, which then sort of influenced the rest of that. So it's a both hand. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, you also spoke about fixed mindset versus growth mindset. So uh, there's a lot of talk uh, even in India about, uh, you know, we have started with IQ and then went to EQ and now everybody's talking about AQ, which is Adapt. I guess there are two versions of AQ. One is adoption quotient, and the other is adversity quotient. So, yeah. I, I, have you actually seen companies who are now looking for people with uh, AQ, and as and because they fit into this whole agile, nimble culture? Yeah, I mean, I think that is. So, I'm also the um, director of our entrepreneurship center um, at, at BC, and I don't think it's any accident that you know. I just think whether it's AQ or I, I, the entrepreneurial mindset, you know, I, I interviewed, um, his name is blanking, but it's on the front of my book, Eric Reese, um, the, the man who wrote uh, Lean Startup and sort of is focusing on how to bring startup mentality into a science. 
And he said, whenever you're dealing, so I interviewed him for another research project. He said, whenever you're dealing with uncertainty, you're doing a startup, whether you like it or know it or not. And so, you know, one thing we've certainly seen over the last 18 months is this entrepreneurial mindset has been critical uh, for helping companies navigate uh, COVID because it's, we're dealing with uncertainty. And if we think this uncertainty is going away, um, I think you're, you're fooling yourself. I think change and disruption uh, is here to stay because these as, and, and I think we're still at the early stages. You know, I asked um, the head of Google Cloud, are we in the golden age of cloud? And he said, no, we're just at the beginning because once companies move to a cloud infrastructure, um, their ability to sort of change and evolve and pivot while also being stable is just so massive. And I, and I don't even think we're close to there yet. Um, and so I, I think we, you know, it, this entrepreneurial mindset or, or AQ, I think is only going to become more important because business is going to keep changing. Uh, and I think COVID is just going to accelerate. COVID caused that. And I think COVID is going to be the thing that also creates the platforms by which they happen more readily in the future. Yeah, thanks. Uh, since you mentioned cloud, there's a question on cloud. So uh, I, I, most reports say that cloud adoption is less than 20%. So the question is that, do you think that if the view of cloud is that it's a business architecture and not a technology architecture, will that accelerate the adoption change? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, it's would accelerate adoption. I don't know. Will it accelerate the disruption once adoption happens? Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, it is shocking that cloud is so low, um, cloud adoption. And I, I see that, at least what I've seen over the last 18 months is the evidence for cloud now is incontrovertible. Uh, and you're seeing new industry, you know, new platforms crop up in every industry, sort of very specific cloud verticals, whether it's in legal, whether it's in retail, whether it's in restaurants. Um, and so I just, I see that, you know, only increasing. And then once the cloud is in place, that enables so much more business innovation and disruption. So I just, I, I think the amount of change we're going to see in the next decade, we can't, it's going to pale the, the, the disruption we've seen in the past 10 years is going to pale in, in comparison to what we're going to see in the next time. Yes. Okay. And actually, that brings me to the, to the next question, which is, uh, in your book, you, clear, you mentioned that this is not the first time that we are having some kind of a shock, right? We have seen yeah. several of these over uh, many, I mean, through business, as long as business has existed, there's been shocks. So the question is that the 2008 financial crisis resulted in the fintech industry. So what are the two or three new industries that will emerge of post COVID? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, and I think cloud is one of the, all these cloud verticals, you know, is, you know, Salesforce alone is not good enough for every company. And um, again, I, I, I heard the founder of a, a, of a legal, legal cloud company, it just, you know, it changes the whole business model there. So I think, all of these cloud things are going to be sort of huge coming out of it. You know, let me disclaim, let me just say, if I could accurately guess this, I'd be a lot richer than I am. So, um, you know, exactly how this is going to play out. I'm really good about prognosticating, but uh, investing is another story. Um, I also think analytic. I mean, I, this was so one thing to, to comment. I, I was surprised as I went back and actually looked at it with clear eyes how disruption has been fairly periodic over the last century. And I, I only know US history, so I, I speak from a US history perspective. Global financial crisis, and in fact, you'd argue we are overdue. Um, global financial crisis in 2008, um, dot-com boom and bust, um, and terrorist attacks in 2001, fall of the Soviet Union in 1990, uh, you know, global uh, petroleum shortage, hostage crisis in the 70s, uh, Vietnam in the 60s. I mean, it's just, you can literally go back you know, before that World War II. So you can literally go back and about every, at least from a US perspective, again, that's 
where my education history is. I'm sure, I bet you could go back and, and see some very similar things. Um, about every 10 years, there's a massive disruption. Um, and so we, we have been due. And it does create massive, you know, and not only fintech, but blockchain came out of, of financial, of the, the 2008 crisis. So I do think we're going to see massive amounts uh, of change. And exactly how that's going to play out, I think, is, is still up in the air. Thanks. Uh, so you did mention, you know, you, about rich getting richer. Right? So the question is that will platform companies or the hyperscaling companies, will they be the only survivors at the end of this, whenever this ends or if it ever ends? Um, and how and can non-platform companies, sorry, uh, how can non-platform, which are, I guess, pipeline companies yeah. still have some bargaining power into the future? world? Yeah, and I think, um, yes, to a certain degree. Um, you know, I think there is the, and this is, I think, some of the big questions out there um, is to what extent can pipeline businesses adopt platform aspects? So, you know, supply chain is one great example. You know, up till recently, it was all about making your supply chain more robust. You know, it's how do we make sure or, or, or more efficient? It's about sort of like, we want to fix this supply chain in place and we want to make it so that we can sort of make move things through as efficiently as possible. That also turned out to be very brittle is if one part of your supply chain gets knocked out, what happens to the other parts? And can you do a more platform oriented? Is there such thing as a platform supply chain where you have multiple suppliers? You, you think of it, you know, a great example is going from traditional telephone to internet, your telephone, you had to have one channel locked in wherever you were in the globe in one circuit. Internet says, okay, we're going to like break up the packets and, and get them back to where they want to go. Can you start thinking of supply chain in that way where we're not going to have one, we're not going to have one source. We're not going to have one supplier. We're going to have multiple that are going to supply our competitors. And it's just going to sort of, it's going to create this more resilient, robust um, and do you think about that in terms of platform? So I, I do think there are, yes, I think platforms are going to win. The question is, can traditional companies integrate that to enough of a degree into their business model to win too? So they need not, if I heard you right, they need not convert themselves to platforms, but as long as they integrate themselves into platforms, they should be fine. But would they not, would they lose bargaining power if they do that, Dr. Keen? Um, I think it just changes the bar. You know, it's there, there's a lot of nice research coming out of sort of Boston University. Um, I loathe to mention our competitors in Boston, um, but there's a lot of nice work coming out about platform strategies. And I think that's only going to increase. And yes, you have to manage. You have to, you, you, you might need to think about influence in a different way. And it's not necessarily just about driving your suppliers to the lowest possible uh, environment. But if you can create a network and a community of, if, if you can create a robust platform, you're doing it in different ways. Um, and if you become the platform um, and, and worked with a company called AppDirect, that's really, you know, thinking about, um, you know, how do you set up app marketplaces? How do you create platforms? And very eight traditional companies, you know, things like, um, you know, Honeywell, which is, you know, very sort of, you know, pipeline company producing stuff are thinking, you know, how do we sort of create an app platform to interact with our physical goods that, you know, changes the nature of our competitors and our cooperators. And so I, I just think platforms change things. Uh, and yeah, we'll weaken it. The question is, does it create new strengths that you can also leverage? Yeah, thanks. So one last question, uh, Dr. Kim, before we let you go. I know it's early morning and it must be a cold morning in Boston. It is a little bit, yes. yes. So, uh, so I guess the question is that everyone says that you need to have a clear vision to, to successfully transform. But how can one even develop a clear vision in such an ever-changing world? Yeah, so two answers there, which are exactly opposite from one another. Um, one, my... Um, one of my advisors in my PhD program was fond of saying, the future is always under, best understood from a running start. Um, and so the lesson is, you know, look back at the, you know, my first IT class um, was taught by a guy, brilliant man, 
um, basically who worked for GM back in like the 1950s and it was their digital transformation efforts. You know, and if you understand the long history of where these technologies and these tech trends come from, I do think you can see the future a little more clearly. Um, with disruption, if I had known ahead of time, if I had thought ahead of time, oh, you know, about every 10 years, there's a global disruption and we haven't had one in 13, um, we might be, I don't know where that's coming from, but maybe I need to, to, to be prepared for something like that. So if you, if you understand the history, you better understand the future. So that's lesson one. The second one is one thing we recommend um, that is very counterintuitive to, to many executives is what I call absurdly long-term strategic planning. And once a, once a year, you sit down and you do strategic planning on a 10 to 20 year time frame. Uh, and most people say, how on earth am I going to get the technology right in a 10 to 20 year time frame? And the important thing is that you're, it's not necessarily that you are, um, but the important is you're thinking at that scale. Um, so I worked with, I did a talk at a healthcare conference one time, and they were talking about the next iteration of their you know, electronic medical record system and all these sort of incremental things. Whereas if you did this 10 year strategic plan, you were going to realize the industry was going to be different by the time you got these next in, in implementations in place. So it's not just, and you do it every year. So are you going to get it right? No. But are you thinking at the scale that you need to and the level of disruption? Because you may, the large trends you can oftentimes see. Uh, and then I interviewed the head of population health at Cerner, um, which is a healthcare provider. Um, and he said, and what I try to do is envision multiple possible futures and figure out what is going to be true in many of these futures going forward. He said, you, to what extent do you see that giving patients access to better access to their own information is going to not be true in the future? And he said, I don't see any situation where that's not true. So we're going to focus on things that's going to be true in multiple possible scenarios in the future. So it's about scenario planning. And we talk about this in the new book. It's about scenario planning. It's about sort of taking uh, basically no lose bets that it's going to be true in, in many of these things, as well as predicting where might these big opportunities be and invest small amounts in, in ones that could pay off huge in the next 10 years. So it's about just structuring a portfolio of innovation. Got it. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Kane. I mean, really appreciate the uh, almost more than an hour that you gave us uh, this morning. I, I, Audience, I think a lot more questions, but I guess we'll wait for the to get the book in, in India. <laughs> well, we're uh, pushing hard to get it in India, so um, okay. hopefully that's going to be happening soon. Yeah. If it's not so, on on behalf of our director, uh, Professor Jannat Shah, uh, the faculty, alumni, and students, uh, and all the participants, we thank you for your time again this morning. Really appreciate it. It's been such an uh, enlightening and engaging uh, discussion. So, thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Hello, and welcome to our panel discussion on Society 2.0, the rise of digital anthropology. Uh, I welcome all of you from uh, wherever you are, and I hope that you'll sit back and get something out of this session, right? Because we have a great panel uh, on board, and it's a, it's a topic of personal interest for me, and a topic I think which is evolving. So I'm sure that there'll be a lot of takeaways. Um, you know, as researchers, you know, we understand ethnography, right? It has always been one of the principal tools uh, through which anthropologists have tried to understand uh, people, have tried to understand populations, right? But as we, you know, as we understand about ethnography, it is about spending time in the, in the, in the field. It is about prolonged engagement. It is about immersing ourselves in that particular context. Right? But with the advent and increasing relevance of technology, we are now seeing anthropological approaches being applied in digital settings, what we now call as digital anthropology. And this has a fundamental impact on business settings in varied areas, including design, consumer behavior, and new product development. So what then is digital anthropology? Right? It has been broadly conceptualized as how individuals interact with technology or interact with the digital itself. 
Um, it, of course, it's a relatively new phenomenon and therefore it is evolving, right? So, and our understanding of it is evolving, our understanding of its applications are evolving. Um, so just to conceptualize this discussion, you know, we could look at how Daniel Miller, um, you know, talks about this, um, an eminent anthropologist. He says that um, digital anthropology includes understanding the consequences of the rise of digital technologies on specific populations. It includes the use of digital, uh, digital technologies within anthropology. And it includes the study of digital technologies themselves. With that kind of a context, I would like to introduce our eminent panelists, experts and leaders in their individual domains and who collectively can provide us a rich perspective on today's topics. Let me first welcome Kanika Sanghi. She's the partner and associate director, Center for Consumer Insight at the Boston Consulting Group. She leads BCG's India Center for Customer Insights, which drives BCG's work in developing proprietary insights about Indian consumers. She has over 16 years of experience with BCG, and her work with Indian consumers spans across industries, which includes consumer products, retail, financial services, durables, et cetera. She actively drives new research on multiple topics related to Indian consumers, and she has multiple publications on some of these. Uh, some of the recent ones includes the impact of COVID on consumers, consumer megatrends, digital consumers, consumer purchase pathways, street star smart segmentation, and the rise of the rural connected consumer. Uh, a very warm welcome to you, uh, Kanika. Thank you for, you know, um, acknowledging and coming over to this panel discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the welcome. Next, let me introduce uh, Sanjay Menon. He's the managing director at Publicis, uh, Publicis Sapient India. Uh, as the managing director of Publicis Sapient uh, India, Sanjay is responsible for driving strategy, capability development, and growth of Publicis Sapient's India presence and maintain its status as hub of the company's globally distributed delivery network. He's been at this company for over 20 years and has been instrumental in growing Sapiens India operations since its inception. He's served in various business and delivery roles, including running key account PLs, managing global delivery for some of the business units, and growing digital marketing services capability from India. Um, before joining Sapient, um, he was uh, a consultant, a supervisory consultant with the management consulting practice of PwC. A warm welcome to you, Sanjay, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Rajesh. Excited to be here today. Sure. And finally, uh, let me introduce Dr. Simon Ro uh, Roberts. Um, he's a partner at Stripe Partners and a board and the board president uh, of Epic People. Simon is a leading business anthropologist whose consulting experience centers on product, business, and platform strategy. His expertise lies in researching the emerging frontiers of people and technology and landing that understanding with impact in complex organizations. Simon's 20-year career has included founding the UK's first dedicated ethnographic research company and running an innovation lab at Intel. He is currently board president of Epic People, a global community of practitioners doing ethnography for business and organizations. His recent book, The Power of Not Thinking, How Our Bodies Learn and Why We Should Trust Them, was shortlisted for the Business Book Awards 2021, and his work has been covered by Bloomberg, The Financial Times, and BBC. Uh, there are a couple of interesting you know, perspectives, a uh, uh, couple of interesting connections um, for Simon related to India. One, that he did his doctoral research in Varanasi and explored the satellite, satellite television revolution at that time. And second, uh, you know, a connection with I'm Udaipur because um, you know, Simon and his team uh, are collaborating with the Consumer Culture Lab at I'm Udaipur in terms of understanding how India's digital heartland in terms of consumers in tier two, tier three cities and rural areas are responding to digital. So that's that's a project that we are very, very interested in and we are working together on. So thank you, Simon, for uh, taking time out and being part of this panel. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Delighted to join in. <clears throat> sure. So let me set the ball rolling, uh, you know, and just to get into the first question. So, and this is for all of you, right? So I just wanted to understand from your experience, could you share your perspective of how digital anthropology has become more important in 
business settings. Um, you know, anybody, any, anyone can take the lead. Maybe Kanika, do you want to go first? Sure, happy to. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, basically answering how digital anthropology has become more important in business settings. Um, as we've looked at it, uh, you know, working with our different clients across sectors, uh, I think two different perspectives come to mind. Uh, one has been very much around understanding the interactions which consumers have with digital. And, you know, I think sitting here in India or actually sitting right now anywhere in the world, we all understand how important that is uh, for any company to reach out to consumers for their products or services. Um, we've been actually, we've been tracking that very, very closely. And we've seen that, you know, across cohorts of consumers, uh, what initially till I think five years back would have been called a more metros, you know, more younger consumer phenomena has now very well expanded to cover all types of consumers. You know, you mentioned just now about rural, you know, interestingly, we've been spending a lot of time studying rural consumers as well. And, and, and we've seen, you know, how decision making and how just everything, you know, not just decision making when it comes to product services, but just life decisions um, are being taken more and more uh, leveraging information which is available uh, online. So I think one, from that perspective, therefore, if anybody wants to connect to consumers, engage with them, you know, establish their uh, establish their brand, um, you know, there is no way uh, digital is not a part of, uh, of that plan. Uh, the second, of course, has been more from the perspective of understanding consumer behavior and how, you know, uh, we as um, insight practitioners Practitioners over the years have been had been going to consumers, you know, observing them in their life settings and trying to infer, uh, you know, from there uh, how and why they do things the way they do. Um, if there was anyways a wave towards digital in India, you know, about utilizing more and more of the digital uh, practices in doing that uh, in doing that kind of research. Um, however, I think with COVID over the last uh, one and a half years or so now, it almost became a necessity. And there's been a big uptake in, uh, in just utilizing digital to understand consumers. You know, So we've been doing a lot of work uh, from that perspective as well, just utilizing digital methodologies uh, in the entire consumer discovery process. And uh, you know, again, uh, there is no way, I think, uh, without uh, without utilizing that, that the companies would be able to get the right uh, consumer side insight um, onto the table. So, I, so I guess you know, from both those perspectives, it's just become phenomenally uh, important. Uh, you know, even more so with the with the with COVID. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Kanika. I'm just wondering, Sanjay, like uh, with some of the work that you do at Publicis Sapient. Uh, what would be your perspective on this, uh, you know, specifically related to maybe consumer behavior or the consumer discovery process? You know, how has um, digital anthropology, you know, what is what are the uh, impacts of using digital anthropology maybe? Yeah, no, I think it's had, a, it's had a profound impact, right? And I think it'll continue to have an even more profound impact in the times to come. Uh, I would almost start with a bit of a headline, <laughs> bit of a provocative comment saying, you know, a brand that uh, is not looking at its consumers in the context of a digital world is not a brand that will, you know, hang around for too long, right? Because at the end of the day, that's what the consumers are. I mean, at the end of the day, a brand only exists in the service, in the context of servicing and providing value to its consumers. So you've got to be where your consumers are. Consumers are interfacing with the world through the veneer of digital, right? That's just the way it is. Whether it's, you know, like I, there's a, I love this profound term. It says, you know, there is no offline anymore, right? And that's so true. So to me, but I think one of the advantages and I think one of the reasons that and digital anthropology, and to be very honest, I hadn't heard the term, you know, long before this. I mean, you know, we, I guess there are many synonyms out there in the world, but the key is really understanding the mind of the consumer in the context of digital, right? If, if I were to kind of, you know, paraphrase it that way, I think one of the big advantages that's, that's switched with the digital is that your ability to understand your consumer is now omnipresent, right? It's there all the time. So, you know, for a lot of the work that we do with brands is actually them uh, getting a sense of their consumer to then make sure that they treat each consumer as a market of one, 
and that's possible now with uh, you know with with digital right because you have you have preferences you have behaviors and you can you can model and correlate nine different behaviors together which you know 10 15 years back wasn't there right you made i mean i remember when you know when when i started off at sapien and we used to do user labs right when we were, when we, when we were building travel websites you brought people in your white label websites see what clicked you know was this button here better or not you did you know low fidelity prototypes etc to now you basically know through you know cookies and every other kind of form out there that what are people's preferences what's working what's not working you're able to do ab testing i mean you just have such a better sense of your consumer today that you can make far more informed choices but more importantly you don't have to go with the choice of one and i think that's the biggest part i think the business setting is benefiting because you could be uh, the brand that just that consumer sees and the next consumer sees it differently i mean you look at netflix i mean i love the fact with netflix the thumbnails have millions of combinations for the same show and depending on your past viewing behavior the image that you see on your thumbnail is unique to you right so at, and why is that happening it's only it's only changing because they have a sense of you as a consumer even as a prospective consumer so you know i think that's to me the power the power of information of data to be used in the context of providing more value that's more contextual to you so i think that's the to me the biggest shift and therefore uh, you know i think and that's the power now you know one uses misuses maybe it's story for another day but at least that's the power that's today vested which can be really really used to create uh, you know a lot of a lot of very very specific and targeted value so to me that's the most exciting part about i think you know digital anthropology in its in in, in its power and possibility but also the reason why i think it's changed business settings forever and it will just continue to you know disrupt and evolve from there sure thanks uh, sanjay and uh, you know very interesting in terms of you know how um, you know the consumer as as you know trying to target at a at a individual level right so which which is now possible with a lot of the statistical data so let I, i'll just go to simon and uh, you know i just wanted to get your perspective because we understand anthropology as being immersed and as being able to understand uh, within a particular context over a period of time so when we talk about digital anthropology um, how has that you know what are your perspectives in terms of how maybe stripe partners is looking at it maybe some of the projects that stripe partners is involved in and how how do you see it impacting business settings more um <clears throat> yeah i mean i think i'd start by saying how could there not be uh, a sort of an anthropology of the digital in the world that we live in right that um you know technology is is you know to sanjay's point a brand that that, that doesn't exist online doesn't really exist well a uh, uh you, you know uh, an anthropology that doesn't look at uh, people's inter inter uh, interactions with technology and their digital uh lives uh and the traces that uh, to his point that they leave as it were um or in and on kind of online platforms um you know without that then the what, what understanding could you possibly have um so I, i think the you know the the point about the point about sort of data you know we we do of course you know kick off a huge stream of 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 digital uh, fingerprints if you will every everywhere we we go and i think the growth um you know you can look at two things really i mean one is the emergence of of enormous platform companies which are creating if you will the environments in which you know many of our relationships and interactions are mediated but actually if you look within those companies you see a massive expansion in uh their building out of research capabilities um you know hiring if you will people like me people with some form of social science degree or at least some sort of social science interest um and um and they do that of course alongside you know large um cohorts of of data scientists and um you know i'm particularly interested in in how those two things play together how those two communities play together because um you need one and with the other um and one alone will not get you um any answers and um or, or at least meaningful answers and a meaningful perspective um and so to answer your point more directly about the sorts of projects we do you know we find ourselves working alongside these you know essentially cohorts of anthropologists and ethnographers and social scientists uh, but also cheek by jowl with with data scientists because um data scientists need need help in understanding where to look what sort of signals um might they 
um, find interesting, which they can can then operationalize. Um, and so I think, you know, I see in, in a really interesting space emerging where there's a possibility for, you know, maybe a profound reconceptualization, if you will, of, of how data science and social science can play together. Um, and, and certainly that's, that's something that my professional practice is, is increasingly interested in. That's very interesting, right? So one of the things that we kind of look at this data and say that this is thick data, right? Uh, on the other hand, we have this idea of big data, which is of course, you know, um, uh, has a lot of traction. So it's very interesting to see how you can combine thick data and big data to come up with, you know, insights, which are very, very interesting for business. So just let me just move on from there. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to understand because I, I look at this as something that is evolving and maybe something that has uh, gained relative importance more, you know, this understanding of digital anthropology. So from your experience, I just wanted to uh, find out like when, when a business problem in, is put to you, either from a client side or from within the company side, um, how has, you know, the understanding of digital anthropology uh, help you to maybe respond to it in a different way. So any any examples that you might have in your own companies or, uh, you know, this understanding of digital anthropology, how has it helped you to respond to a problem that has been put to you um, or has it helped at all? So uh, maybe Kanika, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Sure. Um, no, absolutely. You know, I think, uh, you know, the fundamental way, and, and I, I'll, you know, talk more from the, you know how we used to do ethnographies in the more in the more uh, real um, you know in the more real physical way uh, versus how we've done that more recently, right? Um, so the approach itself has changed quite you know dramatically, and there've been both positives as well as a few gaps which we have felt you know as we kind of adopted the more digital approaches, right? So this was a just to you know give you an example. We were working with uh, uh, over actually earlier this year. Uh, we were working uh, with a with a company which is basically in the in the restaurant space, right? So they they have like a chain of restaurants um, across uh, the country, and uh, we were working with them on just their overall branding and growth, uh, and how should they go about it? You know, what should be their footprint for expansion? What should be the proposition that they have for consumers? You know, what should the brand stand for? How premium versus mass? And questions like these. Um, in the more traditional world, of course, you know, we would have gone back to consumers and done a, and done a fairly extensive, um, you know, uh, one fairly extensive research work, uh, but then also done a few very deep conversations with consumers, you know, tagged along with them as they went to different cafes, observed them, you know, what they are picking up, what they're not picking up, why they're making those choices. But we were doing this at the peak of, you know, the second wave of COVID, so we did not have the uh, the luxury of actually uh, doing any of that. So what we what we ended up doing instead was, you know, we we used actually a lot of digital tools in trying to replicate uh, and understand as much about the consumer as we would have had otherwise. So what we did was actually a combination of different approaches. So one learning was that, you know, when you move online, maybe one one approach doesn't work. It has to be like this, you know, basket of multiple different approaches because unlike just going and talking to one consumer where you are able to, you know, maybe talk to them about multiple different facets, when you're doing this online, you know, different online touch points provide you a read into different aspects of the overall behavior and just doing one approach doesn't help. So we try to do a combination of multiple things with consumers, you know, one uh, we, of course, created these, um, you know, we created these uh, WhatsApp uh, groups with some consumers uh, and WhatsApp is, you know, very easy, very uh, efficient, especially when it comes to Indian consumers. Um, so, you know, instead of like in, a, in the typical world, we would have placed certain diaries or asked them to record information. Now it was easy to say that, you know, if you're stepping out anywhere and stopping by anywhere to pick up something to eat and drink, just send a WhatsApp notification, just put your picture of where you are, what you're eating, you know, uh, and that's it, right? So it, it it helped create actually a much more real database than, than actually, um, you know, the, the typical diary they would have had. We also, you know, asked them to actually post these short videos, you know, so when you're sitting in the 
uh, sitting somewhere, you know, with your friends or family, and um, and and you know, trying to get get a meal together. Uh, like post a short video of you know what is your experience like what are you liking what are you not liking about the place um, we captured you know we did like this um, you know separately we did like this entire social listening exercise to just see what people are talking about when it comes to going out these days you know what are the things which are what and plus what they're talking about different brands as well you know what is working not working so you know we crawled some data from aggregators like Zomato. So we tried the combination of multiple things to create, you know, replicate uh, the entire uh, physical experience. Um, I think a couple of things actually work much better than the, uh, you know, than otherwise. Uh, we felt that the data was actually much more, uh, much more real, much more genuine. Uh, than otherwise, because people were not like we were not dependent on people to uh, remember, you know, actually why they made the choice they made. People were telling them to us in the moment, right? So it was much more real um, and much more uh, genuine, you know, much better quality uh, insights that we were able to get from there. Um, we were able to actually, you know, when we shared it back also with with the business that we were working with, they were able to almost, you know, live the experience along with us because we just had so much footage to share back, right? So it made it also much more alive for everybody, um, you know, than, than otherwise. Um, I think the, you know, like I mentioned earlier, the one learning for us from the experience was that, you know, uh, we, we had to do this combination of multiple things. Had we just tried to keep it simple and say, let's just do this, you know, in the digital world, that would not have worked. We had to, you know, it, so it just forces you to maybe think a little bit more about saying that this is the entire consumer journey and how do I make sure that I am getting a touch point with the consumer, which will give me a good read for each of the parts of that entire journey, right? So it just, so that was the, I think that was one learning to say that, you know, that thinking is required, but I think overall, um, overall it actually went very well. Um, and we were able to, um, you know, we were able to get a very good pulse uh, you know, from these different uh, digital lipsticks that we ended up doing. That's that's fascinating. So, you know, this whole idea about how do you integrate, you know, real life experiences through digital means, right? So, and something that we're trying to do now, maybe because of COVID, we're not able to do what we thought was, um, you know, the, the real ethnography, right? And we're forced to do something digitally, but that has its own um, advantages, which we never saw from before, right? So, I don't know, Simon, if you have any thoughts on that, right? So um, how some of these things have worked for you. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly do because I've spent, you know, well, until obviously COVID, I've spent nearly all of my life doing field work in person. And, um, and at some levels, um, well, necessity is the mother of innovation, right? So you you, well, you have no choice. Um, and when you have no choice to do things, um, you can learn, um, you learn to adapt and you learn to adopt techniques. Um, and they are indeed useful. I, you know, i.e. digital remote uh, kind of techniques. However, I, I also sort of feel that particularly with our technology clients, um, there are significant limitations and the type of work that we do is very interested really in the practices of, of people in and on technology. And um, yes, you know, diaries are good for, you know, as a precursor to, to interviews on Zoom, you know, you can, you can develop a perspective on, on their context uh, as, uh, as Kanika uh, indicated, um, but actually it is the, you know, what I've called the generative practices that we perform on technologies where the real meat is, right? The meat in terms of, well, what are people trying to do and in order to do what? You know, these things ladder up from, you know, an, an action on a, on a device, you know, to, to, to larger um, systems of meaning. Um, and, you know, getting at what people are actually doing is incredibly difficult in an online world. And um, in many of the projects that I've been 
involved in. I've, I've just been doing some some work with a, a technology company looking at the use of laptops for kind of managing life, you know, from daily admin to should we call them life projects. And you know, one thing that that strikes me in that is is you know the connection between the tools that people use on a laptop and the larger dynamics of their life and their the existential aspects of their life and each of these small actions on a computer build up to something much bigger but accessing them is very difficult remotely so you know yes we have to put up with 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 what mother nature has given us at the moment and and we've done well i think to adapt um but i you know i firmly believe there are limitations and if we really want to get to the heart of the matter um you know when it's safe to do so we need to get back out into the world uh, i'll always believe that as long as i die as long as i live sure simon uh so yeah it, it's a you know it's, it brings up again an interesting point of what is you know like this virtual worlds sorry i just, I just want to add uh, sorry if you sure, want, sure. Want, want to add something to i think what simon said which i and kanika said which i completely agree with which is it's a combination right i think but I think Simon said something which is really, uh, really deep, and I, I wanted to make sure at least uh, I, I wanted to build on that. Which is, at the end of the day, I think technology is only a means to an end, right? It is not the end in itself. So I think you know what we do with it is 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 more important than what the technology does because the interpretation of you know what's the motivation, what's the trigger, what's the action, you know, it's like that still is where I think the you know the the art and the science comes in. Technology only elevates and creates more possibilities and more information for you to do things with. It, it doesn't tell you what's the right thing to do. And I think where I've seen this really work well is, for example, we were working with a large bank in, uh, you know, in the UK uh, a few years back, and they were doing this customer journey-led uh, transformation, which is where I think most, most, most kind of brands are doing today. Now, how do you come up with the personas is one thing, right? Because a brand has a sense of who their personas are and who their TG is. And the other one is the, the behavior you get tells you where is your TG really coming from, right? And sometimes it is there is a bit of an aha moment where you know you're fascinated about who your consumers are, and then you figure out where where you're really making money, right? And and some of that is uh because you're getting the but now once you have that information, it's still absolutely important for you to understand that consumer what are their motivations and why are they doing what they're doing. So again, with the same bank when we were working, uh, they always felt that their biggest market was the forty plus segment, you know, people who are in there approaching the middle ages. A decent savings plan, want to get into investment plans, etc. And uh, what they didn't realize was they actually had a decent funnel of the the younger population, uh, you know, in the kind of the 18 to you know 30, who were coming in but not becoming consumers, right? But they were coming at them through the digital channels. And so when we saw this analysis, so we said, you know, what about this segment? And when we spoke to them. They, it was an aha moment because they were largely applying for, let's say, retail loans, either student loans or other small form loans. And the bank's mechanism of you uploading like, you know, seven different documents waiting for eight days to get to know have you qualified or not wasn't working. So when we we said, okay, that's the analysis, but what's really happening? So when we went and spoke to the uh, those consumers, they were like, this just feels regressive, right? I mean, why am I uploading, you know, these documents? And then why is it taking eight days for you to tell me I should just be able to put in a few documents and you give me a quick yes or no. And if it's a yes, then I'll give you additional information. Like, you know, why does it take? So it's a it's a different motivation they're looking at, right? And so I think that to me is the power of where you may get a hypothesis, right? And then you go validate that with your consumers. Or in some cases, you know your consumers and you figure out. So it, it is that mix of the, you know, the, the, the physical and the digital because those actions and those interactions definitely matter. I think technology arms you with being able to either jumpstart that you know, go into the certain hypothesis or be able to surface more, you know, uh, information that you can make choices uh, with them. Sure. So, uh, you know, when I, when I hear you, Sanjay, I also kind of think that, you know, some of this is, you know, is this about, you know, how digital anthropology could help in design, right? So designing certain things, right? So how does it work? What What is it that consumers want from a particular technology? What do they want from a particular device? Um, so I think that that is also an important part of how where digital anthropology is playing a major role in terms of designing some of these new technologies. Um, so I don't know if uh, any of you have any thoughts on that in terms of you know, maybe projects that you've worked on or how, because I also want this to be a session where maybe you know our listeners and people who are listening to this um, 
uh, also see the users or where digital anthropology can help them, right? Especially in business settings. So, so this is another part that I just wanted to quickly talk about in terms of how maybe user, um, how user design or is it technology design itself or device design? Um, some of your thoughts on that would be very welcome. So maybe, I don't know, Simon, maybe if you um, wanted to start off on that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, building on what I said before and Sanjay's comments, I mean, you know, in a sense, you know, we shape our, our technology, our tools, and our tools in turn shape us, right? And, you know, always for me, it's about trying to get to, trying to define experiences, right? Trying to define what it is that we want people to feel, Um you know, and, 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 and what do we want them to feel where technology is not, not just how does the technology make them feel, but how does what the technology enables them to do ladder up to, to an experience. So I found in my work, particularly with a, a semiconductor company that, you know, in a sense is a long way down, up, down the stack, right? You know, they don't make software, they don't make platforms, they make the ingredients that go in the device. And, and that's really challenged me, I think, you know, versus work with platform companies where you're, you're kind of designing a product, you know, that people are at a surface that people are going to interact with. Well, when you're working at an ingredient level in the technology world, um, you're a long way from that. Um, and what that's done, I think, is help me understand that the significant unifier, if you will, of both of those kinds of projects, you know, surface at, at surface level or, or ingredient level is experience. Um, and, you know, so I, I always try to, to answer the question, you know, people are using something in order to do what, you know, or in service of what. Um, which I suppose in some ways is, is similar to a jobs kind of jobs to be done perspective. But I think, you know, the jobs to be done perspective can can sometimes be a little bit, um, how do I say it, uh, a little bit rationalist in the way it thinks about things, right? That we apply a tool to a, to a job that needs to be done. And, you know, most of the things we do in life, yes, we do them sometimes, so we have to do them, but we're often doing things because of the, the, the feeling, the experience, or, you know, some epiphenomenon that they themselves kick off. So for me, really, I think the unifying thought is, is one about experience. Um, uh, perhaps not a very new thought, but, but one that, that I've come to, uh, to see as the thing that can help me, particularly with these more tricky projects where you're dealing with something very low beneath the surface, fundamental to the experience, but but not something that people have any ability to talk to you about because you know most of us don't understand what what is going on inside most of the technologies that we use. So I, I certainly don't. So Simon, I, I just wanted to pick up on that, right? So just to give everybody a flavor of this. So with this semiconductor company, right? Uh, with the kind of work that you have done, uh, would it be possible for you to talk about any specific insight? Uh, which yeah. you got out of that, which, which um, you know, came through the use of, you know, maybe an anthropological approach. Yeah, and, 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 and some of that work is very public, actually. So we've been instrumental um, in working with Intel, um, and it's, it's published this work. Um, and, the, and the project is, uh, project work that we've done over the last three or four years with them has been in service of the definition of, of what they call a platform. So not what Facebook call a platform or platform companies, but they call it the architecture of, of the devices. And, and that work was designed to, um, to, to really help define what a, a device, a laptop that an OEM would make needed to do in order to perform for a particular type of user, a type of user that probably doesn't have an IT department, that probably has side gigs and side hustles, that often is working this was the original work was pre-COVID, you know, it's working in coffee shops, it's working in shared working environments. Um, and, and again, what sorts of experiences, you know, does that computer need to deliver? And then if you think below that, or what sorts of practices are people engaged in? And, and we, 
um, identified, you know, different modes of work, you know, from expert production, building PowerPoint decks and working in Adobe, you know, to casual creation, you know, throwing ideas around on a Google document, for example, and communication. And, and then this kind of piece around personal organization, doing expenses, doing calendar admin, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and so by deep, so deeply diving into what those different types of work, those modes of work really look like and what they involve and who else they involve, because of course, much of our digital interaction is, is not in the layer of our own skull or just a solo activity. It involves significant other people. Um, so how does that uh, in set, set of interactions you know, transform what it is that people are seeking to do and, and how does a system need to support it? So, you know, very specifically focused on practices um, and the constraints on those practices and the affordances that the existing tools they use provide so that we can ladder up, if you will, to try to distill um, what, a, what a tool set needs to, to, to deliver in order to them, um, for them to feel uh, competent and, and happy and, and productive. Although that is fascinating simply because of the kind of it's an ingredient, right? So one of the you know uh, research projects that we are working on is about, say, for example, this idea of shea butter, right? So shea butter is used in um, you know chocolate, right, as a cocoa butter equivalent. But you don't want consumers to know about that, right? Because it's it's more related to cosmetics and things like that. Right? So you don't want to know that you're eating shea butter, right? So this whole idea of ingredients and the role that it plays. Uh, in, in, in consumers' lives, right? So it's not so easily discernible. And therefore, you know, it's great to understand, you know, a perspective that comes out of that, which, which a company like Intel can use. Um, I just wanted to get maybe Sanjay's and, uh, or, or Kanika's perspective on any, you know, anything related to design, maybe, that you think yeah. that you know, yeah. an anthropological approach has helped you. I'm happy to share, uh, you know, from my experience, I, I, you know, as, as Simon was talking, actually, I could draw so many parallels to multiple projects that we've done as well, uh, where actually, you know, just understanding of the consumer experience or expanding the horizon of the company from saying that, don't think about the product that you're, sell uh, that you're selling, but think about the experience that you're creating for the consumer has been the change in approach, you know, that we've worked with them on. And it's been a big journey. It's been a transformation journey for many of these, you know, businesses that we've worked with who have traditionally have thought about just the product that they're selling and not thought about the experience which the consumer is having, you know, in, in purchasing and then using the product, right? And, um, you know, just, uh, just to share a few examples, you know, um, we were working with this, uh, with this automotive uh, player, um, you know, doing well in the market on, on the cars that they're selling. Um, but then we did this entire journey to say that, you know, how can they become more consumer centric and we don't want to not just from the perspective of the cars that we are designing you know that we've done a lot of research and we know what people want in their cars but can the entire buying process and the owning process of our car be a differentiator for us in the market so people will buy us not just because we are selling brand x but people will buy us because the way we are selling and the experience of actually owning brand x so with this you know this um, piece of work with them to understand um, the entire, you know, journey from a consumer perspective, um, the, from the moment the first thought of buying a car comes to your mind, uh, to the moment, you know, the thought of buying your next car comes to your mind, right? So from your first car to your next car, what happens uh, with you? And, you know, what are the different kinds of support experiences, things which work well, things which don't work well, you know, along the way? And, um, and how can you, as an automotive player, actually cater to many of those? And, you know, it was very, very interesting how it just fundamentally changed the lens the company uh, was applying. You know, for example, their entire lead management process and the design, you know, earlier they would only start thinking of a consumer or actively tracking the consumer once there was an explicit interest shown in car purchase, you know, either online or at the showroom. But then as we did this piece of work, we realized that, you know, the, the passive thinking of that, I want to buy my next car 
starts many years before you actually make your first explicit you know uh, interest shown in in the car itself and if you are actually talking to the consumer once the consumer has already gone into that mode it's very likely that the consumer has already made very you know subconscious choices of what they like and what they don't like so it's very late to actually start talking to consumers when they've come to your showroom or you know when they've actually gone to the gone online because you know then they have they've actually been thinking about it for the past 2 years and they've already made some decisions so how do you actually have you know uh, we basically use that to design certain digital interventions which they will keep doing with consumers over time you know to keep them engaged uh, from the first purchase to second purchase um, you know there were many consumers who actually said that you know i i um, i i want to like in case of cars obviously test drive is an important part of how you figure out and get a feel of the car but then people said that you know i don't want test drive experience on on bombay roads because it doesn't really give me a feel of the car i want to get the test drive experience where i would actually ride the car i want to take it off roading for example so i want to drive it there so how do you create that virtually for consumers you know where physically was not possible so we created a set of digital tools actually to try and replicate that kind of an experience for the consumers in the process of buying the car and and you know here's just a few examples but many other things along the way as well um but i think this tr- basically the transformation to saying we are not selling a product we have to sell an experience to consumers and when you take that approach then automatically you know digital comes in along many many you know parts of those uh, because otherwise it's just impossible to deliver on on that kind of experience sure so um, yeah so um, sanjay i don't know uh, if you yeah, want to add something share, yeah i'm going to share sure. a couple of examples uh, i think uh, the one i mean you know it goes back to think when we said design i think sometimes you know we feel the first thing that comes to our mind is a is a physical tangible product right i mean because that's i think how we think about design always it's got a physical manifestation to it and thing experience is really uh, you know is what you're designing now right to the point made earlier <clears throat> so i'll give you a very small example we were working with the large world's largest uh, qsr right based out of north america and uh, as we kind of and that's an ongoing relationship we have with them so we are we're continuously generating a backlog of you know where do consumers see the friction points right and and what some stated some unstated right and and, and i'll get to the unstated one in a second so you know and this company sells burgers you know and and they sell more than any other i think entity in the world and uh, there's a quintessential thing with, with especially with covid and everything that is going on people don't want to be somewhere for too long but they're also traveling to get from where they need to get so the you know simple point of friction i don't want to wait for my burger and i don't want it cold right consumer inside so what are you going to do you're not going to you're not going to build a different kind of a burger right a burger that stays fresh for longer or becomes you know gets done faster that's one possibility the what we did was we designed an experience that caters to this inside with a with a very simple geofencing fix so as you as you start driving to the outlet and you place an order through your app based on your distance to the outlet there's a there's a, a simple trigger at the outlet where the burger starts getting made right based on your journey time that's estimated and so when you get there i mean you know plus minus maybe a, a minute here or there you you got your food so it's a, it's a very small thing so what you're doing here is you're not you're trying to design the experience which is i want to take you with the friction of waiting and don't want it cold right and how do you design an experience around that and i think uh, you know and, and uh, another example uh, i won't say the same as what uh, kanika said but similar is i think the whole uh, automotive industry over the last two years got absolutely you know uh, in, in, in a tizzy with how do i sell cars when no one can come to my showroom right and so how do you take the entire car buying experience online right now you're designing for an experience that we find because it's not like we buy a car every day right or every year so you like the joy of buying a car which is you, you go along you see 10 things and you try try 20 things and you talk about 30 things and then you finally maybe buy one so how do you take that whole experience online was another thing we had to design for right so what do you really do when you you like the tinkering you like the configuration so we created the 3d tool sets where people pretty much had an immersive experience of being in a car showroom right Uh, and they could then order the test drive home so the car showroom really comes to you instead of you going to the car showroom so so you got the preference but what we also did was we built a product for this company internally which is 
what is the funnel? So we always created a visualization of what activity needs to the next best activity, next best activity leads to finally to purchase. So internally for the company, they had a product that actually told them what's like a heat map of, you know, where do people come in? What do they do next? And where are they most likely to land up next? Which then gives them the insight of how to, you know, uh, in a way, gracefully meet the consumer at their next best action and prevent an exit, right? And so, so again, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's about, again, designing experiences. And, and I think that's where, you know, I feel a lot of the, the real power lies because, you know, products finally, as, as I think we've already said, it's, it lies only in the context of the experience and the value that it you know, provides. Sure. So, uh, I mean, again, fascinating insights, right? So for, for me, especially, and for people listening uh, in terms of how some of these things uh, you know, how business problems are solved, um, you know, through some of these approaches. And I just wanted to take a different tack here, right? So one is to know that there is a business problem that needs solving. Um, the other is to kind of, you know, um, how digital anthropology um, helps us in terms of, you know, what is happening from a social science perspective, maybe, right? And I just wanted to, you know, like we, we are at a stage now where maybe we, instead of using LinkedIn, we kind of perform on LinkedIn, or you know this whole idea of maybe uh, work, um, you know, is is from anywhere. So this whole idea of what is real life, what is work life, you know, those those things are blurring uh, in many ways. So uh, you know, just the social nature of work, and I'm just uh, I'm not talking about a business problem, but I'm just talking about maybe a, a something that is happening in society. And this idea of digital anthropology. Does it help us to understand that better, right? So this, uh, where is it evolving? Where is it going? This, this social nature of work. So um, I just wanted your thoughts more at a, at, a, at a societal change level, right? So and how digital anthropology can help. Um, maybe Simon, uh, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, how, I think how it can help is to understand, you know, the, the nitty gritty of what work involves. Right. In the same way that I was talking about the work that um, that we've done with Intel around, you know, what work actually looks like. Right. And, um, um, you know, we've we've also done done work with with companies looking in the VR space again at, you know, very fine grained detail in, for example, what meetings look like, what constitutes um you know meetings how can we analyze meetings in a very particularistic you know fine-grained way in order to understand uh the ways in which they they actually run and the different activities that they involve and the different levels of participation so i would hazard a guess as you say and and i think in the previous panel we are living through you know, COVID is not a one year or a two year thing, you know, COVID is, you know, sadly is, 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 is in front of us for many, many years. And, and in its wake, it's, it of course has fundamentally transformed the ways in which uh, companies get work done. And, um, you know, there are many, many of the big platform companies were very averse to remote work before COVID began, um, you know, and you actually needed um, one big Silicon Valley company in which we studied, uh, we studied remote work for them, uh, didn't have remote work policies, um, you know, 18 months prior to COVID. I mean, it was, you could have, you could have an exception from very high up in the company to do it. Um, so all of that, as we know, is fundamentally has been disrupted. And, and so for me, I think what digital anthropology can offer uh, both to companies, but also to, to companies that are building technology platforms that enable uh, new types of work um, is a very intricate, detailed, nuanced understanding of what people are trying to achieve, what the barriers uh, to that are, um, and, and what solutions might look like. Um, you know, I'm very interested in you know, the massive kind of burst of creativity that's emerged around collaborative software tools, you know, SaaS tools. Um, and, you know, on the one hand, of course, you know, that's very useful. It's, it's very useful for us to be able to interact with each other in collaborative settings. But, you know, once you sort of tear work down and look at it in minute detail, you see that 
of course, you know, there is multiplayer interaction in, in the world of work when you're working on a Google Doc together, but um, there's also single player, if you will, interaction uh, or activity happening. And there's real time interaction and then there's, you know, synchronous activity and then there's asynchronous activity. So, you know, there's a simple framework, a two by two from which you can start to explore, you know, what activities look like in each of those quadrants, right? And, and then start to say, well, you know, how are they served by, by current solutions and, and where are the opportunities? So, so really, I think, you know, it's not new that anthropologists have studied work, but I see it as a massive, massive growth area, if you will, because I think, um, you know, we're still really at the very beginning of trying to design the tool sets that we need uh, in order for work to be performed, you know, not just productively, but, but actually, of course, to provide some degree of, of pleasure um, and meaning to work. Um, because yes, many of us are lucky, I'm very lucky, I, I love my, I love what I do, and I, I, I live to work rather than work to live. But of course, that's not the case for everybody. So, you know, I think it's incumbent on anthropologists, you know, focused on experience to create, um, it would be idealistic to say a better world, but uh, at least a better working life. Um, and, to, you know, and, and so I think there's, I think there's, there's a lot of, of road to run on, on, on anthropology, digital anthropology in and of work and in and of organizations. Uh, and I think that's really exciting. Sure. So that's that's very interesting to hear. And, you know, for many of us who kind of, you know, maybe are looking for a research topic, and that's that's a question that I saw on the Q&A, is to say, <laughs> what is it that we need to research next? I think the nature of work, you know, is a very interesting area to get into in terms of a research project or a research, you know, um, something that you want to do over a period of time. Um, just moving away from that, and uh, maybe I'll come to Sanjay on this, and I just wanted to understand, right, um, or Kanika, right? So both of you, um, so some of the work that you have done, of course, we've talked about digital anthropology and its uses, but are there certain challenges that you have faced or what challenges do you foresee going forward? So um, your thoughts on that, right? So just the use of this digital anthropology, what are some of the challenges that you see with its use? Yeah, I, I, I could go. Kanika, do you want to go first? No, no, please go ahead. All right. Now, I think, uh, you know, as with anything that has immense potential, right, and, 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 and possibility, there, there's also the, you know, um, <laughs> there are also the potential pitfalls, right? And I think uh, there's this, uh, there's almost, I think, quasi-religious debate on if you look at the continuum of, you know, convenience and privacy, right? Uh, because the more, the more that we are, uh, you know, we go through all the powers that we said about technology surfacing the possibilities and people not even knowing, no, you know, people not knowing what they want, to, what they know, right? Or what, what, what they actually feel like. In fact, this is a very interesting line. I think it was a Reed Hastings from Netflix who said people always lie, right? Uh, and it's, it came from the fact that uh, the preferences people gave on Netflix about what they like to watch and what they actually watch was completely different because they wanted to be positioned a certain way about what they say they watch and what they actually watch so so sometimes you know so there's there's the power there but i think so there is convenience when you are willing to uh, you know leave your footprint uh, your, your fingerprints as simon said and those fingerprints being interpreted and served back in your you know in your you know for your convenience and value but there is a loss of privacy as well so i think to me i think with digital anthropology it's it, it's a few things right so one is i think there is a convenience and privacy kind of thing you know where do you go so is security confidentiality i think some of that is a is something we'll have to really watch for the other one is uh, i think simon referred to this earlier right there is we are still attuned uh, for human interaction right uh, that's where we seek the most meaning out of conversations in fact even in the context of work to your previous question the one thing that you know everybody's been working from home i mean we've had a phenomenally robust model of moving 100% virtual but the one thing that i would say that has suffered at one level is camaraderie right? Because we still shake hands and, you know, look people in the eye and form relationships, right? And, and you can sustain it virtually, but it's difficult to get the same level of depth and intimacy. So similarly, I think as we, you know, as, as, we, as we think about the, it's just not the methods and the, and, and the tools, right? There is a level of human interpretation that comes from interaction, that comes from, you know, uh, building a connection in your context and how do you do that? So I think 
those some of the challenges we have overcome I'm, i'm not saying they're unsurmountable i mean the world has learned a lot in the last 18 months i'm sure it'll like learn even more in the next 18 for who knows but i think those are some of the challenges right how do you bring in that how do you keep the human element at the core of it and i think then how do you you know navigate very carefully uh, where this whole convenience versus privacy kind of continue sure so very very interesting so i don't know kanika did you have anything to add on to that or um no i think sanjay covered it quite well actually i was just going to say you know the the, the big the only thing uh, i wanted to say was building on the second point which sanjay mentioned about you know uh, i think we are moving to a digital world but we are still living in an offline world right so we have to i think some people people sometimes people tend to exaggerate you know their discussions to say will the kirana store in india die because everybody is buying online and we all know that's not going to happen so i think there is a tendency to also exaggerate uh, you know at times and it's important to stay balanced uh, in how we look at digital as well i think digital is there to make people's lives convenient but you know i think there is a value of the physical world uh, which i don't think is going away anytime soon yeah so so uh, i wanted to stay with you kanika on that and maybe get on to maybe our last question um i just wanted to understand right so maybe this idea of a digital anthropologist right so somebody who uses it still means anthropologically um what do you see um, is the future of a role like that in 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 business settings right so what what are, what are your thoughts on that and maybe i'll uh, close with taking the thoughts from simon and uh, sanjay but i would like um, to hear what your thoughts are kanika yeah no i you know i think that that you know somebody calling called an digital anthropologist basically somebody who can uh, who can who can interpret how consumers are interacting with digital what are the insights we can drive from there and what are the implications of those insights for the business is is a very very important role going forward you know as consumers interaction with digital are growing right i can see that role basically playing at the uh, you know in between the business as the and the insights role basically somewhere between the business and insights to say that you know we are keeping a track of what consumers are doing i would imagine that unlike the more traditional consumer insight role in the companies where businesses kind of go to the to the insights team to say we want to investigate this question and can you come back to us with consumer insights for this i think the role of the digital anthropologist would be more around would be more proactively going to business and saying we are actually seeing this is what consumers are you know doing digitally because what consumers do digitally actually provide us cues to a lot of things which could start happening over time right so instead of that role being being like the more traditional research role which you know we, we where you do the standard uh, una and all of those exercises it will be more somebody who is basically keeping a track of the of the new things happening with consumers you know what are the cues that we can pick up from what consumers are talking online and can we convert those to what it could mean for our business i think it's a it's a very very important role uh, for any business and i could see that you know actually across sectors you know across sectors that as being something which is very important sure uh, um asanjay um, any thoughts on this yeah i think um you know to me when you said digital anthropologist i'm reminded of the term you know digital strategist you know any of these see i think we, we digital as a prefix will go away right because uh, i think every craft will operate in the context of the world itself becoming digital you know this is like uh, you know 10 years back people said i need a digital strategy and today i need a strategy for a digital world right so i think similarly i think the the future is and again i'm 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 not qualified by craft to say this you know i'm simon kanika way more qualified than me on this my my perspective is purely from a business lens is that i think you you're going to have anthropologists for a digital world right which i think is already here so i think th- that i think is is the future but i think the reason it's key which i completely agree with is that ultimately you know we seven and a half billion human beings right um, you know at, at the core of it uh, we make meaning out of the world through uh understanding each other right which means the study of human behavior is still you know still by far one of the most complex things that happens and will continue to happen so i think the role of uh, the anthropologist i think you know is 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 going to be key 
I think the context within which the interpretation will need to happen, the tool set with which it will need to be enabled to get to the same you know, outcome, I think that is going to change and that's going to keep changing rapidly. So I think, you know, if, it's like with everything else. I mean, if you look at the, it's like you look at any craft, I think, you know, what happened to it in the last hundred years versus happened in the last five years versus in the last five, you know, maybe, you know, 18 months, there's an acceleration. I think this is going to be the similarly the case. But I think, uh, but, but I think that the core of it, it's, you know, the study of human behavior is still by far the most valuable interpretation we need to make sense of everything else that then needs to happen beyond that. Yeah, well, that's fascinating, Sinjay, in the sense that, you know, I think this context of a digital world is is what maybe, you know, is going to drive this and, you know, the the, the prefix of digital might go away, as you say, but, you know, the, the world itself, um, you know, becomes just like, you know, just daily life. And so anthropology will still play an important role there, right? So, yeah. Uh, any thoughts, Simon, before we go? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, people in the finance industry say past performance is no uh, no guarantee of of the future right but i you know i think if you look at the uh the stock price of anthropologists in business it's uh it's uh it's it's gone it's done nothing but go up um and um and i feel the pain as somebody running a business that um you know it's a very tight labor market there's an awful lot of so for you know the many participants here you know if you're studying anthropology you've, you've done a very good thing well done um there's a massive opportunity ahead of you um for the simple reason that sanjay um uh indicated which is uh, you know at the heart of every business as peter drucker said you know every business exists you know really only to serve a customer that's that's the only reason it exists and to do that you have to understand people and understanding people has been at the heart of what artists and musicians and poets and everybody in any free society ever has really been about trying to understand the human condition. Um, anthropologists don't have a uh, monopoly over that. Um, but I think what's happened in the discipline over the last 20 or 30 years is that they've become, uh, many uh, anthropologists have become very good at understanding how their craft can be deployed in um, and for businesses. Um, and businesses have, um, you know, in different countries and at different times received anthropologists uh, warmly or less warmly. Um, but I think they are waking up to it. And, um, and it, you know, if the hiring curve um, from you know many of my clients and many other businesses is anything to go by this is not letting up um, and this is becoming uh, increasingly central to their to their strategies um, not just for surviving but for thriving so um, so yeah so you know uh, there's much much more of it to come um, because there's more disruption to come um, but also fundamentally because you know the nature of the human condition is that we we ask questions like why, you know, what are we here for? Why are we doing things? What's it all about? Um, and anthropologists are good at that. Um, businesses need to know it. So, so it's a marriage made in heaven. So on that very, you know, very positive and very optimistic note, uh, I think we can take leave, but I wanted to, you know, thank you so much because it's been a wide ranging discussion. And I think, you know, as I said, it's something relatively new, this whole idea of digital anthropology uh, and therefore, you know, for our audience and for me myself, right? So I think they have been, these have been very interesting perspectives, which are very wide ranging, especially because your experiences are wide ranging. So I wanted to thank all of you for taking time out. I know you all have busy schedules and we are very, very thankful that you were able to make time for this. Uh, so we really appreciate it. And I wanted to thank you on behalf of uh, Director, uh, Professor Janat Shah, um, on behalf of all the faculty, all students, alumni, you know, everybody here at IIM uh, Udaipur, including, you know, the audience uh, for this um, for this lovely discussion. And um, I really enjoyed it. I hope our audience really enjoyed it as well. So thank you so much. And we really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay.